All right, going to do a message on the door of salvation. Very interesting study the Lord had me do. Um, the other night I was working, I guess it was actually last night, I was working um, on my uh, expository study on the book of Revelation, and I came to chapter 4, verse 1, and uh, you know, that's where I'm at right now, and, um, and there's different things mentioned there, and a door is open in heaven, and I thought, I wonder, you know, the, the word door. I wonder how many references to door and what are all the different things there. The Lord kind of put this in my mind and I thought, well, I'll start to, you know, just kind of start a, a word study of this word door and see if there's any significance. And uh, what the Lord showed me just blew my mind. And so I was going to work on the Revelation study, but, you know, the Lord had me do this one. And uh, there's some... There's some good ones in this. So let's go to, we're going to start out here looking at the word door. We're not going to look at every reference to the word door because some are just, you know, not real significant. But there's some that are very interesting. Go to Genesis chapter 4. The very first reference to the word door in your King James Bible is Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Uh, very interesting, because I'm going to kind of spoil the surprise here a little bit, so to speak. But when we get to the New Testament, you're going to see in John chapter 10 that Jesus Christ says, I am the door. Hmm. And what did Jesus Christ do when he died on the cross? He became sin, who knew no sin. Jesus Christ became sin. He's the door. If you do, uh, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. I thought, isn't that interesting? Jesus being the door, this is kind of a future, maybe a future prophecy. And I'm going to show you that there's some that are definitely prophecies. There's just no way around it. But this is very, very interesting. The door symbolizing Jesus Christ. And when you're doing wrong, that sin that you're doing lies at the door. I thought that was pretty neat. Let's go to the next one. Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 14. I'll read down to verse 18. It says here, Make thee an arf of gopher wood, Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shalt thou make in the ark, and shalt pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fatch, fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be three hundred cubits, the breadth of it fifty cubits, and the height of it thirty cubits. A window shalt thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shalt thou finish it above, and the door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. With lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and every thing that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant, and thou shalt come into the ark, uh, thou and thy sons and thy wife and thy sons' wives with thee. So there's a door in verse 16. The door of the ark shalt thou set in the side thereof. And it's interesting, with lower, second, and third stories shalt thou make it. Hmm. Uh, Paul talked about being caught up to the third heaven. I thought that was interesting. Lower, second, and third stories, and there's a door that leads into it. Hmm. Rather interesting. Jesus Christ is the door, and there are three heavens. Lower, second, third. How about that? Look at uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Where was the Lord? In the ark. And how do you get into the ark? Through the door. There's none other name given among men. There's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Peter said in Acts chapter 4, I think, verse 12. 
Hmm. How about that? Next, let's go to Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Well, there's there's some good ones in this study. I mean, this is a this will be a blessing to you if you love the Lord and you love his word. Genesis chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, unto Abraham, in other words. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Hmm. Interesting. So he sees the Lord while he's sitting at the door of his tent. We're going to see the significance of that in just a little bit. Another reference to a door. Very interesting. Now I'm going to show you a real good one. Genesis chapter 19. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's begin in verse 4. I'm going to read down through verse 11 and see if you can pick up some things here in relation to the end times. You know, you read back in, I think it's 2 Peter chapter 2, where it talks about Lot, you know, being vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked from day to day. They vexed his righteous soul, you know. So there's a tie-in with Lot and the end times. And I never saw this before. I've read through this passage numerous times, preached through it numerous times, and it's just like reading it, I'm going, wow, I never saw this before. In relation to the door. Genesis chapter 19, verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out at the door unto them, and shut the door after him, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known men. Man, let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. It's amazing what living in a very wicked city will do to you morally. Lot was a righteous man, the Bible says so, and yet he was willing to bring out his two virgin daughters and let a group, a, a large crowd, a mob, if you will, of sodomites rape them. Evil communications corrupt good matters, the Bible says. Hmm. Verse 9, And they said, Stand back. And they said again, This one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. It's going to be interesting. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, blindness both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. You ready? This is an interesting thing. Lot, there's a tie-in to Lot in the end times. Okay, God could not judge Sodom and Gomorrah until Lot was removed. Okay? Think about the tie-in here to Christians today. All right? What did Lot do when the Sodomites came and they're out there circling around his house? What did he do? Lot walks out of the door and he turns around behind him and he shuts the door. And Lot is the only one standing between him and the door and the angels on the other side. The two men that came in to stay with him that night. They were there to judge Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, the city of Sodom there. They're behind the door. Isn't it interesting? A Christian today, we read over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. Verse 8. Interesting. The Christians today are standing between the lost world and the door, Jesus Christ. We are hindering. We are the ambassadors of Christ, the Bible t says. We are His ministers, ministers of reconciliation. We are standing between the lost world and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? Now what happens? 
as we're preaching the gospel to them, as we're saying what the Lord wants us to say, they're getting angrier and angrier at us. And they want to get rid of us and tear down the door. They want to break down the door like we read in our text there. Hmm. And so what happens? The Lord says, well, you just need to go through it. You're just going to go th through this great tribulation time period. No. Those angels reach out through the door, which we'll see later, and get Lot out of harm's way. He uh, kind of is caught up, you know, caught up through the door, like that. And we're going to see this tie in later on in Revelation chapter 4. It's a very interesting thing. He goes through the door, and what happens? The door shuts. And those sodomites are smitten with blindness, and they can't find the door. You say, well, I, I don't get 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12, talks about God sending them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Pleasure in unrighteousness. What is sodomy? Having pleasure in unrighteousness. Very interesting. So you have, right now, we're still, see, let me explain something about radical sodomy. All right. At first, they have to come out with the thing of we respect people, we should respect our differences, we, you know, diversity, tolerance. They're doing all this stuff until they gain a firm enough foothold, and then they're going to switch the whole thing and say, okay, if you speak against us, we're going to get rid of you. You should be executed. You should this, you should that. And there are already some that are there. They're calling it hate crime if you say anything at all against sodomy. All right. And of course, they're raising up their little, you know, Jesuit coadjutors, you know, temporal coadjutors, helpers of the Jesuit order, you know, temporal meaning in worldly matters. Uh, not so much within the church, but they do it in worldly matters. But they'll raise up their, their hate people like the Westboro Baptist Church with Fred Phelps and these guys that are going around saying God hates fags with their signs. They raise up Stephen Anderson, you know, and they, they constantly are giving him media attention to, to bring Bible-believing Christians to make us look like hateful people. And that gets the sodomites fired up and everything else. And then they start to say, let's forget tolerance. Let's forget diversity. We're just going to go out and, you know, attack these Christians. And that's what's happening. And it's going to get to that point where the sodomites are going to be saying, we're going to do things to you, Christians. We're going to get you. We're going to get you in like this. And it's at that point, I believe, that the Lord's going to say, come up hither. And up we go. Just when things are really starting to look bad for the bride of Christ, the Lord's going to say, come up hither. Right through the door. Revelation chapter 4. We're going to see it here at the end of the study because we're going to go through from beginning to end of the, the Bible. So we're going to end up in Revelation. But it's very, very interesting. So I can't wait for us to be able to leave. <laughs> but when we leave, they're going to be smitten with blindness. God's going to send them a strong delusion that they all might be damned. And what is the thing that happened to Sodom? It was burned. Fire and brimstone rained down from God out of heaven and burned it. What's going to happen to the Sodomites that refuse to repent of their evil ways and come to Jesus Christ for salvation and continue in their lifestyle and things? What's going to happen to them? They're going to burn fire and brimstone forever. How about that? Let's go to the next one. Exodus chapter 12. Another reference to the door. Exodus chapter 12 verse 3 says here, speak, you un, speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. Ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats." And ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. There's some major prophetic stuff to what Jesus Christ did. He's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. And they killed him. The nation of Israel rose up and killed him. Their Messiah, their Savior. Prophecy right there. 
and it gets even better. Verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. Hmm. How about this? So you take the blood from the lamb that was slain, and if this is the door here, we'll say this is our door, you put blood here, and you put blood here, and you put blood up there. You understand? Like that? Hmm. Exodus chapter 12, verse 21. Exodus 12, 21 through 28. Let's read that. It says here, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel, and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. <laughs> and ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye be come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye this, or what mean ye by this service? that ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel and Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. So let me get this straight. You go to the door, and you put blood on the door. And when the death angel comes and he sees the blood on the door of your house, he passes over. And you don't get the wrath of God. How about that one? Very interesting. Next, let's go to Exodus 21. Exodus chapter 21. Let me get a piece of paper here. Beginning in verse 2. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. Hmm. That's kind of interesting. I thought that was kind of a, a unique thing too. So basically seven years, you know, is what the servant, his time there, uh, six years he's serving, the seven year he goes out free. Hmm. Um, so if you buy a Hebrew servant, then he's there for six years and the seventh year he goes out free. So if the Lord buys Hebrew servants in the time of Jacob's trouble, they would ha be there for six years in the seventh year, the end of the seventh year, they go out into the millennial kingdom free. How about that? Verse 3. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master have given him a wife, and, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, or unto the door post. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. Hmm. The Bible says, ye are not your own, ye are bought with your price. In the New Testament. I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. I had to come to the door. And now I'm a servant, and I will serve my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, forever. And any Jew that gets saved in the time of Jacob's trouble, it's going to be the same thing for him. 
slightly different thing with the salvation there. I realize, you know, we're saved by grace through faith alone. There's no, you know, works as far as keeping the commandments and things. There's no mark of the beast that I have to worry about taking or not taking. Um, in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's Revelation 14, verse 12, says the faith, keeping the faith of Jesus and, or keeping the commandments and the faith of Jesus, and you have to worry about taking the mark. Um, so it's a little bit different, but the point is, you're still going to be a bond servant of Jesus Christ if you get saved at that time. You'll have to go to the door to be saved. Hmm. Next, let's go to Exodus chapter 26. Amazing what the Lord can show you over some simple little word, just like door. You know, I just, you know, trying to get my work done, and the Lord's just like, hey, do a study on the word door. <laughs> I'm like, ah, I'm trying to get Revelation chapter 4 done. You know, do the door thing. I'm glad I did it. Glad I listened. Exodus chapter 26, verse 36. And thou shalt make an hanging for the door of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen wrought with needlework. Hmm. And hanging for the door. Hmm. Huh. How about this? Go to John. Keep your hand there. In Exodus. Go to John chapter 19. Into the New Testament. John chapter 19, verses 23 and 24. John 19, verse 23. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts, to every soldier a part, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it. Whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did, or they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. John being an eyewitness to, and watching what the soldiers were doing. Hmm. So back here in Exodus chapter uh, 26, verse 36, you have, Thou shalt make an hanging for the door. Uh, fine twined linen wrought with needlework. Hmm. It's woven. I thought that was pretty interesting. And another, another thing that was very interesting too is the fact that the uh, covering there, two of the collars are purple and scarlet. Also very interesting because when Jesus Christ was crucified, they put on him a purple and scarlet collared robe. Hmm, how about that? And isn't it also interesting that Mystery Babylon, her collars are purple and scarlet? You say, well, how's that work out? Satan always counterfeits what God does. You see, if you didn't have this King James Bible, you wouldn't be able to tell Jesus Christ and the devil apart. And I've done that in other studies. I've gone over these things. You know, Jesus is called the angel of the Lord sometimes. Satan appears as an angel of light. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Satan roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Over and over and over and over again, Satan is counterfeiting Jesus Christ. Another interesting thing there. A door, and it has a hanging, a covering, that two of the collars are purple and scarlet. And that's what Jesus ends up wearing before he's crucified. Hmm. Next, next, let's go to Exodus chapter 29. Exodus chapter 29, verse 4. It says here, And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and shalt wash them with water. How about that? If you go over to, keep your hand there in Exodus chapter 29, and go to Ephesians chapter 5. Aaron and his sons were priests of God. And today, Christians are, we, you know, I believe in the priesthood of the believer. According to the book of uh, 1 Peter, I think it is, talks about the priesthood of the believer. 
So, you know, we are a royal priesthood. Um, very interesting. But how does this tie into the New Testament? They're brought to the door to be washed with water. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Let's start there. It says, Husband loves, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Hmm. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So you come to the door in the Old Testament, the door of the tabernacle, to be washed, to consecrate yourself in the office of a priest. In the New Testament, you come to the door, Jesus Christ, to be washed by the Word to help you in your office as a priest. Hmm. How about that? And you know, I, I've saw a video recently, a brother was saying about how that, you know, he's been watching some of my videos and he said, you know, he wasn't quite used to the thing of it being an hour and a half or two hours long sometimes. And he's like, but yet I watch it and it's, it's interesting and I'm getting into the word more and things. That's what it's about, brethren. You know, um, if you want help in this life, if you want to, you know, have victory over sin and things like that, you have to be washed in the water of the word. You just have to do it. If you are forsaking this book and putting this book down, your flesh is going to take over. Uh, you know, there's an old old uh, analogy I heard the one time, um, and that is there's two dogs within you, so to speak. Okay, Your flesh is one dog. Your spirit, the Holy Spirit of, of God, it's in you. That's the other dog. If you feed the spirit, he'll be stronger than the flesh dog, and he'll beat him. <laughs> And the other you know, dog will be afraid of him. If you feed the flesh dog more than the spirit dog, it's going to be the opposite. Kind of a crude analogy, but the point is, uh, it tells a really good truth. We as Christians have, have to be constantly in the Word. And if you put this book down, even for a few days, you're going to feel it. You will feel it. And if you're struggling with sin, I suggest you uh, up the dosage. Take a few more uh, showers, so to speak, spiritual showers, get washed in the water, but you have to come to the door to do it, Jesus Christ. He's the one that will open the scriptures to you as well, by the way. Go back to Exodus chapter 29, verse 31 through 33. It says here, And thou shalt take the ram of the consecration, excuse me, and seethe his flesh in the holy place. And Aaron and his sons shall eat, of the eat the flesh of the ram and the bread that is in the basket by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And they shall eat those things wherewith the atonement was made to consecrate and to sanctify them. But a stranger shall not eat thereof because they are holy. Hmm. So they're eating flesh represented by bread. You know, flesh and bread together, I should say. What do we read about that? Turn to John chapter 6, to the New Testament. The flesh of a male sheep, a ram. John chapter 6, verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live for ever." These things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. And by the way, when you go down to verse 63, he says, It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. All right. Jesus was not talking about literally eating his flesh and blood as he's standing there. Okay. What Jesus was doing is he's relating back to what's going on in Exodus chapter 29 there. He's relating back to that and saying, 
the priests come to the door of the congregation or the uh, temple there, the tabernacle, and they eat the flesh of a male sheep, a ram. They eat the flesh and bread. And Jesus is saying, I'm now the bread. And you come to me and put your faith in me and you, your faith in my death, burial, and resurrection, you know, death on the cross and then his burial and resurrection. You put your faith in me. All right. Very interesting. But it said that they're not supposed to have a stranger eat of it. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I mean, the tie-ins with this stuff is just absolutely amazing. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, a stranger, in other words, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Hmm. Isn't that something? Again, they're eating at the door of the tabernacle. Very interesting. Go back to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus 33, verse 8. And it came to pass when Moses went out in, under the tabernacle that all the people rose up and stood every man at his tent door. Remember what we read earlier about Abraham? He's at his tent door and he sees the Lord coming and he runs to meet him from his tent door. Check this out. Verse 8. Uh, and stood every man at his tent door and looked after Moses until he was gone into the tabernacle. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the tabernacle the cloudy, cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and the Lord talked with Moses <laughs> tell me this stuff is a coincidence I don't think so it's amazing verse 10 and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and worshipped every man in his tent door almost like the tabernacle there and yet you can have that personal relationship there in your own home Interesting. A whole lot more I could say on that. But verse 11, And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again unto the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. Oh boy, there are so many things we could say there, but it's just, it's amazing. And you can have a personal relationship with the Lord right now, and Jesus is the door. Hmm. And you can speak to him face to face. Spiritually speaking, we will be eventually speaking face to face. Um, incredible. We don't have to go through some kind of a priest or some kind of a special priest office or whatever else. We can now come boldly before the throne of grace. We can now come and actually pray right to the Lord. Next, let's go to Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Let's read this. And the Lord called unto Moses, and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. And he shall kill the bullock, bullock before the Lord, and the priests Aaron's sons shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about upon the altar that is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Hmm. So in other words, 
there has to be a sacrifice made and blood sprinkles and cleanses. Hmm. How about that? Another interesting thing there in relation to the door. Next, let's go to Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus chapter 14, verse 11. It says here, And the priest that maketh him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean, and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Good picture of a soul winner. The Lord has us, you know, gives you an opportunity to, to witness to somebody and whatever else. And you say, would you like to be saved? And that person says, I think I would. Yeah, actually I would. This is something that's been bothering me for a while. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to know about salvation. So you bring them where? To the door. Why? So that they can be clean, to be made clean. Interesting. Leviticus chapter 14, verse 36. Leviticus 14, verse 36. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest go in into it to see the plague, that all that is in the house be not made unclean. And afterward the priest shall go in to see the house, and he shall look on the plague, and behold, if the plague be in the walls of the house with hollow strakes, greenish or reddish, which in sight are lower than the wall, then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again the seventh day and shall look, and behold, if the plague be spread in the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which the plague is, and they shall cast them into an unclean place without the city. Hmm... Another very interesting thing there, another interesting symbolic thing that the Lord is doing here. Why? Well, because the house of Israel right now is unclean. And uh, they're going to be shut up for uh, seven years, the time of Jacob's trouble. Seven days here. Hmm. And uh, what happens at the end of that? The priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house, and shut up the house seven days, and the priest shall come again the seventh day, and shall look, and behold. So the priest goes out through the door of the house, and he comes back into the door of the house seven days later. Pretty interesting. Almost like the body of Christ leaving, you know, the house of Israel gets uh, kind of purified. And, you know, there's, there's other tie-ins there, and it's like, well, you know, you could make some arguments there and things, too. You know, we're like lively stones, you know, the Bible talks about. And uh, people are, you know, sometimes compared somewhat to stones. So you get unclean stones that go through the time of Jacob's trouble, and they're still filthy and stuff at the end. They haven't accepted Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And the Lord casts them out into a ruinous heap, you know, basically outside of the city. Jesus Christ comes back and judges from Jerusalem, Matthew chapter 25, judgment of the nations. Very interesting. But let's keep going here. We have a bunch more to do. Numbers chapter 20. Numbers chapter 20, verse 6 through 12. And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and they fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. Hmm. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Take the rod, and gather thou the assembly together, thou and Aaron, thy brother, and speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth to them water out of the rock, so, sh so thou shalt give the congregation and their beasts drink. Hmm. Interesting. We know that the water is the word. And the door there uh, of the congregation is a reference to Jesus Christ, but he's also called the rock. Interesting. Uh, verse 9, And Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Hear now, ye rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? And Moses lifted up his hand, and with his rod 
he smote the rock twice, and the water came out abundantly, and the congregation drank, and their beasts also. It's kind of like a picture of a preacher that doesn't get his interpretation of Scripture from the Lord. He goes with his own understanding. He hits the rock. And he says, here, rebels, I'll give you some water. Hmm. Verse 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, Because ye believe me not, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore ye shall not bring this congregation into the land which I have given them, Hmm. I would sure hate to uh, disappoint the Lord in my preaching and teaching of the Word of God. I would sure hate to advise you to go and study Greek and Hebrew and tell you that there is no perfect English translation of the Bible. And there we all have to study, and you should. I really recommend that you go off to a seminary someplace and you can learn from the learned doctors and elders and things like this. I'd sure hate to be like that. Um, again, to reiterate many, many times over, I've said this. My purpose, my job, is to point you to a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and to an understanding of His Word from the Lord. You can have that personal relationship. Absolutely, you can. Well, let's continue. Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy 11, verse 18 through 21. Another good one. Therefore shall ye lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as frontlets between your eyes. And ye shall teach them uh, your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Look at this one, verse 20. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates, that your days may be multiplied in the days of your children, in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. Wow. So you're to lay up God's words in your heart. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I might not sin against thee. The Bible also goes on to say, very interesting. And you should actually write them upon the door posts of your house. Hmm. Come to the door as priest to be washed in the water of the word to cleanse yourself. There are so many tie-ins in scripture. Don't even tell me that this book was written by men. This thing is inspired by God. Job chapter 31. Job 31. Verse 33. It says here, If I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom, did I fear a great multitude, or did the contempt of families terrify me, that I kept silence and went not out by the door? We'll get back to that in a minute. Oh that, oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me, and that mine adversary had written a book. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. What's the significance there? Well, I believe that the book of Job is symbolic of a Jew that goes into the time of Jacob's trouble. Again, Job is on the ground for seven days. That number seven again. And, you know, you can look at the order of the books in our King James Bible in the Old Testament, and you have the Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble, Job, Psalm, the king comes back, Proverbs, wisdom comes. It's a very interesting study, but, you know, I've done a preacher rapture moment on that. You can watch that one, the order of the books in the Old Testament. But notice, there... Verse 34, did I fear a great multitude, or did the contempt of families terrify me that I kept silence? You know why a lot of Jews don't get saved right now? Because they're worried what their families will do. They're worried what the other people in their nation will do to them. 
what you know, I might get kicked out of my nation. I, I'm going to get kicked out. They're going to disown me. And and it and it's real, you know, for a Jew. I understand that. I'm not trying to downplay that. I mean, I've I've studied Judaism a little bit, and and I know that they actually will have funerals for a family member that leaves Judaism and becomes converts to Christianity or something. I mean, it's it's a real deal. I've known of Jews that that their families are like, you're dead to me. Don't ever come around again. You know, they get persecuted on a very high level. But it still is not worth you going to hell. It still isn't worth you rejecting Jesus Christ and saying, I'm just going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not a good idea. But notice it says there that they kept silence and went not out by the door. I thought that was fascinating. Because they kept their mouth shut, because they didn't get saved, they didn't bear the reproach of Jesus Christ, they didn't get to go out through the door and miss the time of Jacob's trouble. How about that? But look at verse 35. Oh, that one would hear me. Behold, my desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. You know what the Jews think of you as a Christian? They think that you're an adversary. Most Jews believe that Christians are adversaries because they associate Roman Catholicism with being Christian. And I can understand why they would think the Catholics are adversaries, because they are. The Catholic Church has been the greatest murderers of Jews in the last, essentially, 2,000 years. They persecute them over and over and over and over again. And they're going to do it again in the future, and it's going to be the worst time ever. But it's interesting because it says, His desire is that the Almighty would answer me and that mine adversary had written a book. Well, what's the book that the New Testament Christian, Christians, I should say, have written? I kind of answered it there, didn't I? <laughs> the New Testament. And how about the book of uh, Revelation? Verse 36. Surely I would take it upon my shoulder and bind it as a crown to me. You know what the most important possession for a Jew in the time of Jacob's trouble is going to be? New Testament, specifically the book of Revelation. Why? It's going to tell them what's coming next. Play-by-play -play book written by the adversary of the Jew, the Christian. Romans chapter 11, verse 28 says that as touching the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. You know, the Jews right now, as far as you know, the gospel is concerned, they are enemies. We are adversaries. A Jew that doesn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ is an adversary to a Christian. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, they're going to realize that the Christians were their friends. The real Christians. Because understand, Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. Never has been, never will be. But let's continue. Psalm 141. I do pray that the Jews, if there are any Jews watching this, that you would seriously consider Jesus Christ and the New Testament, that you'd read it for yourself with open eyes and see that it is very, very, very pro-Jewish. Psalm 141, verse 1. Lord, I cry unto thee, make haste unto me, give ear unto my voice when I cry unto thee. Let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth, Keep the door of my lips. Hmm. You know what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Hmm. Um, so Jesus could be the, there could be a door there, your mouth, be compared to a door? Oh yeah, Absolutely. Do you give Jesus credit for things when you're out in public? Hey, that's a really nice car you got there. Oh, thank you. Praise the Lord. Jesus got it for me. What? <laughs> uh, that's a nice day today, isn't it? Oh, yeah. I praise the Lord for a day like this. It's a good habit to get into. Let the door, Jesus Christ, be your mouth. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. 
do you have Jesus in your heart? You say, well, yeah, I'm saved. Does he come out your mouth when you talk? It's a challenge to all of us. Next one, Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Verse 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's going to be the reaction that we have when we see Jesus Christ. I mean, we're going to be caught up, we're going to have uncorruptible bodies, and I understand that and everything else, but, you know, understanding the sinful, wicked nature of your flesh, and, you know, yes, we're supposed to talk about Jesus Christ, but brethren, it's a struggle sometimes. There's times that you're going to fail. You're just going to be like, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Yeah, boy, nowadays, it's crazy. I thought that was interesting. Again, another reference to the door there in verse 4. Hmm. And it ties back to Revelation. You know, we're going to see that in the Revelation chapter 4 study where they're saying, holy, holy, holy. They're naming the three parts of the Godhead. Rather interesting. Ezekiel chapter 8. And there was a bunch more I saw, you know, as I was going through this, doing this word study, and it was like, well, you know, you could probably make an argument there, and make it, and I thought, well, yeah, but, you know, it's going to be like a four-hour sermon or something here. So I just picked the good ones, you know. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff in this book. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 7. And he brought me to the door of the court. Now, what you read all through the uh, like uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and things going through there, the door of the tabernacle. It's where the Lord's meeting with people. The door, the door, the door. Look what happens when they go bad. Look what happens to the door. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, and behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I had digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. And I went in and saw, and behold, every form of creeping things, and abominable beasts, and, idol, and all the idols of the house of Israel, portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel. And in the midst of them stood Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan. And every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. It's interesting. Did you ever see the Catholic professional or processional? Well, kind of professional too. So many things that my mouth messes up. It actually comes out, you know, they call, I think they call it a Freudian slip or something. Which I think sick mind Freud was a real idiot, but, you know, that's another study. But, uh, <laughs> but the processionals, the Vatican processionals, and they got these dumb little urn things, and they got thing in there swinging it everywhere, and it's like smoke going all over the place. Where's that come from? Paganism. You don't see that in the New Testament. You know, where, I mean, and they gather together at Antioch, and Paul comes walking, and he's swinging the incense thing all around, and he's got this robe on and stuff, and all the little altar boys are coming behind him, you know, you know, like this. <laughs> Catholicism, yeah. Verse 12, Then said he unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what... The ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Hmm. He said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz, uh, one of the false gods. Uh, you have Semiramis, uh, Nimrod, and Tammuz, their son. 
And you can study, you know, there's a lot of different things out there on that. The Two Babylons has some good stuff on that. Uh, David Daniels' his book on uh, Babylon religion, I think it's called. <clears throat> also very good. Verse 15, Then said he unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about five and twenty men, with their backs toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, and they worship the sun toward the east. Baal worship, in other words. This, again, this is what Roman Catholicism does. You see the, the priest or the pope, and he's got the round cookie, like the sun, and he takes it and he elevates it slow, like the rising of the sun. Just like that. They're priests of Baal. Verse 17. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger, and lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury, mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. So you can actually have people taking the door and putting false worship, pagan things, saying this is for the door, this is for Jesus. We're doing these things for Jesus. No, you're not. You are using ancient pagan ways of worshiping Jesus Christ. See? Again, another tie-in perfectly to today, to the modern world. And it's not just Roman Catholicism. You get this Hillsong Church and a lot of these other modern wicked things, and they're playing rock music and you know, all this really, really wicked stuff. Rock music comes from the occult, brethren. And you can't take that thing, something that God calls an abomination, and then take it and say, you know, this is music, ceremonial music from witchcraft and voodoo, and then take it and twist it and say, oh, we're just going to make it Christian now. It's an abomination. It's an absolute total abomination. But again, very interesting there. Another tie into the word door. Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 25, verse 10 through 13. The parable of the ten virgins. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Hmm. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. I have a whole study on this, the ten virgins, the five wise, five foolish, the whole thing there. And... You know, people try to apply it to the Christians. It has nothing to do with Christians in the church age. Nothing at all. Again, watch the study. I can't get into it all here. But again, we see a group of people that the door, being symbolized as Jesus Christ, is shut. And their salvation, their chance for salvation is gone at that point. Hmm. Another very interesting reference. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Hmm. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment were and his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake, and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Hmm. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him, lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulchre with fear and great joy, and did run to bring his disciples' word. Wow. Again, they go in to the, through the door, and they see that Jesus has gone out through the door. <laughs> Very interesting. I thought that was another interesting tie in there. Mark chapter 1. 
Mark 1, verse 32 through 34. And at even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased and them that were possessed with devils. And all the city were, was gathered together at the door. Hmm. And he healed many that were sick of divers diseases and cast out many devils and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. You know, it's interesting. We were talking about this. Um, my wife and I, we were going for a walk, you know, earlier in our son and things. We were going for this walk. And I said, you know, I, so one of the problems I've had for a long time is I see people and it's like I've learned from these people. And yet later on down the line, I'm going, but they're not saved. They can't be saved. They're doing this and they're saying that. And I'm just going, I thought this guy was saved. And it's just like they're coming out with heresy. They're doing things that just, it just, you know, and I look at their, you know, salvation, you know, that they, their, their testimony. And it's like, that's not salvation. <laughs> you know, this, this is a false convert here. And I'm going, how on earth, okay, if they're a false convert, how can I learn truth from them? This doesn't make any sense to me. And we got to talking about it. And it was like, you know what? God can use anybody to speak truth. And I'm not trying to say that that means that everybody who, says one word of truth is automatically saved. No, I'm not saying that. What's going on here is even the devils, the Lord's saying to the devils, be quiet, because they knew who He was. You see, when you understand who God is in the Bible, you understand that God is in control of everything. See, Hollywood wants you to believe that it's this God versus Satan. God's in heaven. He's up there on his throne sitting there and Satan's down in hell, you know, and he's on his throne and they're like fighting, you know. And you see like these uh, stupid pictures I saw one the one time, like Google images or something. And it's like Jesus is like this and the devil's like, you know, they're, they're like arm wrestling, you know. And it's like, excuse me? I don't think so. You know, the picture from Scripture, you go back to the book of Job, Satan is appearing before God and he's having to report for duty. You know, God's in control of everything. God can take the most wicked, most evil person and get them to speak a few words of truth that you need to hear. Just to show you, I am in control of everything. Boy, it changes the way we should think about fearing men, doesn't it? I, I, brother, I, I understand what you're saying, you know, but I just, I'm kind of worried what's going to happen about this. And, and I mean, I could get in a lot of trouble for it. And I'm preaching to myself now too. How many times have I had times, chances to witness and I didn't take it because I was afraid of what people would think. And yet God is in control of everybody. You get fearful, you know. What happens if I this happens or that happens? God is in control. Even the devils. The people are coming to the door to be healed. And even the devils are coming and he's casting them out and the devils are leaving. They're going, hey, and Jesus says, shut up. Zip. Why? Because he controls everything. And, you know, you get some dumb nitwit atheist and they'll say, well, then I guess he must send people to hell. No, he gives people free will. And if you choose to go to hell, that's up to you. He's atheists. You know, I had one the other day and he's like trying to draw me into the thing. Well, what about this question and question, question, question? Uh, yeah, just like Satan did. You know, yea, hath God said. Starts asking you all these questions. And I basically just said, you know what? I don't care about you. If you know and you reject Jesus Christ, then go to hell and burn. That's up to you. I have no sympathy for you. I mean, you know, oh, you got you got to answer my questions. I got over a thousand videos for free here on YouTube that you can watch till your heart's content. Answer so many questions that people have, and yet I'm supposed to take my time and answer individual little nitpicky things about the Bible or whatever. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Next, let's go to Mark chapter 11. We have very little time left on this earth, brethren. Don't waste time with people that don't want to hear. Oh, brother, you know, I have 
family and friends that don't want to hear. Yeah, don't waste time on them either. Pray for them. Do what you can. But I'll tell you right now, uh, it's going to get to a point where you just have to say, okay, I did what I could. See ya. Mark chapter 11, verse 1. And when they came nigh to Jerusalem unto Bethphage and, and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, he sendeth forth two of his disciples and saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye be entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, whereon never man sat. Loose him and bring him. And if any man say unto you, Why do ye this? Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway he will send him hither. Hmm. Verse 4, And they went their way and found the colt tied by the door, without in a place where two ways met, and they loosed him. Well, there's some neat spiritual tie-ins there as well. Okay, they went their way and they found the colt tied by the door. The door, Jesus Christ. The colt, the Bible talks about the foal of an ass's colt, likens it to a sinner. So a young sinner that can't be tamed, a wild sinner. And they're there, they're right at the foot of the door. And without, they're without in a place where two ways met. Fork in the road. Two ways met. Comes like this. You know what happens? The young sinner, the foal of an ass's colt, comes and comes to the door. And guess what? There's two ways. Accept, reject. What's it going to be? Go into the door. Come to Jesus Christ for salvation. And what happens? And they loose him. The bondage of sin is cut. Like that. You'll still struggle with sin. It'll still be there. But the bondage of your having problems with sin and you can't do anything about it on your own, of your own power before you get saved. And there's a penalty attached to that sin as well. So the more sins you do, it's just like having a backpack and you're throwing more sins in there all the time every time you're sinning and that burden gets to be so so heavy after a while and you're just like, oh, can't somebody help me with this? And you come to the Lord for salvation and He goes, snip. And that backpack falls right off. It's a beautiful picture of salvation. And again, the door is involved. Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13, verse 24 through 28. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut to the door... And ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when ye shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves thrust out. This passage is talking to unbelieving Jews, Jews that have rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah. And one day they're going to come and they're going to look in there towards that millennial kingdom. They're going to look in past Jesus sitting on the throne, Matthew chapter 25, the judgment of the nations, and they're going to say, Hey, Jesus, Jesus, and Jesus is going to say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I don't know you. Oh, no, you don't understand, Lord, see, because I am, you know, uh, Ben Goldberg, and, and uh, this here is, you know, Mordecai Kraft and whoever else here. Um, but we are Jews. The kingdom belongs to us. And Jesus says, uh, no, actually, you get through the door to get into the kingdom. It's only one way in. Hmm. You knock at the door all you want. 
you reject Jesus Christ and you die in your sins, you don't get into the millennial kingdom. All the Jews have this hope for the resurrection and everything else. And uh, those that have died without Christ, they're finished. They're gone. John chapter 10. Now we're going to go to the text that we have here uh, to show you that Jesus Christ is the door. John chapter 10, verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. It's clear. Jesus is the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. The door of the tabernacle back in the Old Testament, where God would come and speak. The door that's there. Sin lies at the door if you do wrong. Your sin, you can have the door take care of it. Verse 9. This one's so important. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in in and out and find pasture. What we read over there in the book of Luke. The pasture is the millennial kingdom. The agrarian world that will be created after the time of Jacob's trouble is over. The amazing, beautiful world with Jesus Christ sitting as the king of Jerusalem. That's the pasture. And you go in Come up hither. My sheep hear my voice, and I call them by name and lead them out. Up you go. And they go out. They go, verse 9 there, shall go in and out and find pasture. And I get this stuff, you know, Reformed theology people, they come along. At Reformed theology, again, if you're a new Christian and you hear somebody say, I'm part of Reformed theology, run away, get away from it. Reformed theology is if you can imagine a piece of Play-Doh, okay? And this Play-Doh is this little ball, and it says Catholicism on it. Reformed theology is they come along and they say, okay, we want to keep the Play-Doh as it is, but instead of Catholicism, we're going to reshape it and say Protestant. They protest the abuses and the, the corruption of Rome, but they don't say scrap it, throw the Play-Doh out. They say let's just reform it. That's why you have Reformed theology people are really not that much different than Roman Catholics. You know, it's like saying, I don't drink beer, I drink light beer. Or something. You know. It's basically what they're doing. Reformed theology, one of the, the primary teachings is that the book of Revelation, all those things happened in the past. And everything about the Millennial Kingdom and all this other stuff, it's just symbolic. Or you'll get some that say, well, we do believe in the Millennial Kingdom, but the church is going to bring it in the church, you know, and Jesus will come at the end of the millennial kingdom to see what a good job everybody's done in the Christian church. Satanic heresy is what that is, okay? The Bible does not teach a post-millennial kingdom, and it certainly does not teach an amillennial kingdom, which means that there is no millennium. That's what Catholicism teaches. Reformed theology teaches post-millennial teaching. I mean, it's, it's absurd, I mean, you know, show me a church that's been around for 100 years, church building, you know, church group of Christians that's been around for 100 years and still going strong. But somehow, you know, well, we can't do that, but somehow, you know, uh, the church is going to bring in 1,000 years, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's Reformed theology, people. Okay, let's, let's continue here. Acts chapter 14, verse 27.
Acts chapter 14. So kind of a bigger Bible study today. That's good. Need that. Acts chapter 14, verse 27. And they went, and when they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. Hmm, the door of faith? Faith in Jesus? Jesus is the door? Also very interesting. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Book of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 12. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and a door was opened unto me of the Lord. Hmm. A door was opened unto me of the Lord. Unique wording. Very unique wording. You know, it's kind of funny because I hear lost people and they'll say, you know, I just don't quite understand the, the wording of the King James. It's just so awkward, you know. And I'll tell you, you know, at first you might read the Bible and you might go, man, this is kind of, uh, does this make sense? Or, you know, where, yeah, you know, you just got saved. There are some things as a babe in Christ you're not going to quite get. But I've come to understand over the years that the unique, you know, wording of the King James Bible um, is God revealing deep spiritual truth. I mean, you know, we're doing a whole study on a word as simple as a door, you know the door and yet look at all the phenomenal stuff that's in the bible about something as simple as a door this is an amazing book it has multiple levels of depth to it you'll read through a passage and go wow what a blessing that's amazing years will go by you'll read through the exact same passage and it'll be totally new totally new revelation you just be like i didn't see that in there before you know wow it's an amazing book. Okay, two final ones here in the book of Revelation. Turn back to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Yeah. Jesus Christ is the door. Yeah, absolutely. And right now, the lost world, they see a door and they just go, well, you know, I don't know what to think about that. You know, the Jew looks at the door, the G, you know, Jesus, and they go, I really don't know. It's kind of confusing and whatever else. But I'll tell you what, if you're here watching this sermon and you're not saved, the Lord's knocking on the door right now. You're looking at Jesus Christ and you're going, I have so many questions, I really don't know what to think. He's knocking. And you go over and you say, I'd like to know about more about Jesus Christ. Open up the door. That's all you got to do. The full of an ass's colt brought to the door. If you want to cleanse the man, you bring him to the door. It's all right there. It's amazing. And what's coming next for Christians? Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for distracting my attention from my study to show me this amazing word in your word. Uh, the word door, simple word, but yet it's so complex, Lord, and has so much, much deep meaning to it. And uh, I thank you, Lord, for your word. Just we'd be so in the dark without it. 
And uh, Lord, I just uh, I praise you for being a door that lets us into heaven and gets us out of this cruel world and uh, this world of sin. I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done for us. And I do pray, Lord, for those people out there that are still lost. They're still wondering what's behind the door. They're just looking at you and, and they're hearing the name of Jesus and they don't really understand. And uh, I pray, Lord, that they wouldn't just look at the door, but they would look at you behind the door knocking and realize that they need to have a personal relationship with you. It's not about joining a church or going to re organize religion. or what it, No, it's personal relationship, Lord. I pray for that, for anybody that's still watching this. And Lord, for those that are saved, I pray that you would help us to understand the imminence of your return and that we wouldn't waste our time on the things of this world. And we would take our opp opportunities, Lord, when we see a door open, when you get into the conversation that we have with people. And I just ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Very fascinating study. You know, a lot of these times, like I said, I wasn't even planning this thing. <laughs> I was just like, I was joking with my wife, and I was like, you know, the Lord sidetracked me, and she's like, huh? And I said, yeah, I'm trying to get my Revelation chapter 4 study done, and it's like the Lord puts it in my head, look at the word door, and I'm going, ah, oh, there's just so much here. But uh, I, I'm speaking that in jest, of course. I'm just being funny here, but uh, I... What an amazing, amazing book we have, this King James Bible. Never ceases to amaze me, you know, when you, when you just read it and you believe it, what the Lord will show you. Uh, boy, I just, wow. <laughs> um, but please keep us in your prayers. Um, I have a big video coming up here soon. I'm not going to give away a lot on it, but uh, it's going to be a big one. And I'm going to be... Trying to get the word or the Revelation chapter 4 expository study done. You know, unless the Lord says, hey, study this word again, then there's going to be another sermon with another key word, you know, Revelation chapter 4. Uh, incredible. But um, just want to encourage you, brethren. I don't know. I mean, we still might have a few years or whatever else, but I just like that thing about Lot, I think was one of the ones that really spoke to me in this study and just like Lot right there and he's like you know the enemy is just like okay we're gonna get you we're gonna destroy you and we're getting to feel like that here today and we're seeing okay we got a jesuit president now again and you know, like george or uh bill clinton was a jesuit um and you know we got this happening and that happening and all this other stuff and the sodomites are getting more and more radical and you know all this stuff and they're just like eh, like this like we're gonna get you don't worry about it the Lord knows. We are withholding, we are letting that Antichrist system. We are the ones that are saying, don't come and attack the door. Don't try to tear down the door. And we're trying to say, hey, anybody that wants to, whosoever will, let him come. Oh, here's somebody who wants to get saved. Come on, open up the door. Shh, go in there. Shh, they're safe. Okay, who else wants to come? The door, we can still get you through. There's still time to get through the door to escape. But boy, oh boy, when the Lord says, come up hither, and we get caught up through the door, and that door goes, <clears throat> and shuts. I would not want to be here. It is going to be a nightmare on this earth. Better think about that. So, that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching and we will see you in the next video.